Night is the chilling account that follows teenage Eliezer Wiesel as he experiences the horrors of the Holocaust. He goes through this alongside his father in Nazi German concentration camps at Auschwitz and Birchenwald towards the end of World War II in Europe. The story's dominant conflicts are with morality and faith. In the beginning, his faith in God is absolute. His belief in an omnipotent benevolent God is unconditional and he cannot imagine living without faith in a divine power. I was almost 13 and deeply observant. By day I studied the Talmud and by night I would run to the synagogue to weep over the destruction of the temple. But his faith is shaken by his experience arriving in Auschwitz. At one point, when his fellow Jews are praying in the midst of walking towards a furnace, the author has revulsion towards God. For the first time I felt anger rising within me. Why should I sanctify his name? The Almighty, the Eternal, and terrible master of the universe chose to be silent. What was there to thank him for? I couldn't help but relate with his dilemma. I've often found myself angry with God. I mean, who hasn't? When reading Night, one can be tempted to the idea that due to the conditions in the death camps, the author is driven from his faith and adopts cynicism. Others have commented this to be the case. But when given the full context of his other works, one can see that this is one piece of a larger puzzle to reunite with God. The skeptic often brings up the topic of evil in this argument. If God is so powerful and perfect, why would he allow evil and suffering? If we examine night, I believe one can see how real and just God truly is. Let's lay out the question. Evil categorically proves that God does not exist as the atheist avows, or evil is explained by the Christian view of God and his purpose in creation. You see, most skeptics begin their challenge to God's existence with the problem of evil, but in doing so, they dig a deeper pit than the one they were trying to get out of because raising the problem of evil without God runs the risk of justifying evil. The Christian worldview suggests that evil is better posed as a mystery than as a problem. Now, to call it a mystery is not to avoid the necessity of a solution. Problems seek answers, but mysteries demand more. They merit explanation. This means that there will need to be overlapping lines of argument, not just a single answer. Peter Kreft, professor of philosophy at Boston College, puts it this way. Getting to Mars is a problem. Falling in love is a mystery. Evil, like love, is not a problem, but a mystery. One cannot address the problem of evil without ending up as the focus of that problem. Skeptics calmly bypass this reality and proceed as if they were spectators observing some phenomenon, when in reality they are part of the phenomenon. The author says, Terrible master of the universe chose to be silent. Rabbi Sachs says it best here. And I ask myself, God, where were you? And words came into my mind. I'm not claiming there were any kind of revelation. And this is what they said. I was in the words, you shall not murder. I was in the words, you shall not oppress a stranger. I was in the words that were said to Cain when he killed Abel, the first murder in the Bible. Your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. God has spoken. It's up to his creation to follow suit. The problem of evil has ultimately one source. It is the resistance to God's sacredness. It's the abuse of the freedom he grants us. It's the rejection of the Holy Spirit inside of us that warns us when something is immoral and wrong. Ignorance to that leads to evil. Evil is questioned from three sides. The metaphysical problem. What is the source of it? The physical problem. How do natural disasters, diseases, etc. fit into the discussion? And the moral problem. How can it be justified? We'll focus on the third issue here. How do you respond to Eliezer's question on the intellectual side without drowning it all in logic and philosophy? No one wants to hear that. Especially after being whipped so hard you lose consciousness. In the depths of pain, it's difficult to see a bigger picture or design. What we want in the moment is some sort of comfort. An analogy from C.S. Lewis may be of help here. He reminded us that when a ship is on the high seas, at least three questions must be answered. Question number one, how do we keep the ship from sinking? Question two, 
How do we keep the ship from bumping into other ships? These two may be obvious, but behind them lurks the most important one. Question three. Why is the ship out there in the first place? The first of the questions deals with personal ethics. The second addresses social ethics. The third wrestles with normative ethics. Our cultures at best deal with the first and second questions. They ignore a rational defense of the very purpose of life and do not know where to turn for guidance. If the ship does not know where to harbor, any harbor will do. If one does not know one's purpose, any destination will do. And it is here that the skeptic flounders on the high seas of life. If we are here purely by accident and we navigate purely by whim, how does one determine whether any journey is in the right or wrong direction? Now we shall see why the question itself defeats the skeptic, who at the same time wants to deny any purpose for life actually exists. The skeptic's first escape in the problem of evil is that God cannot exist because there is too much evil in life. Evil exists, therefore the creator does not. But here, Christianity provides a counter-challenge to remind them that they have not escaped contradiction. If evil exists, then one must assume that good exists in order to know the difference. If good exists, one must assume that a moral law exists by which to measure good and evil. But if a moral law exists, must not one posit an ultimate source of moral law? Or at least an objective basis for a moral law? Something that is transcendently true at all times regardless of whether I believe it or not. Not one proponent of evolutionary ethics has explained how a biological process has produced a moral basis of life, while at the same time denying any objective moral basis for good and evil. Objective moral values exist only if God exists. Now what if it's justice? Halfway through the story, a Jewish prisoner was to be hanged while the rest of the camp was forced to watch. A young boy, beloved by both inmates and guards. Eliezer had seen many hangings by now, but never that of a child so young. The two men were no longer alive. Their tongues were hanging out, swollen and blush. But the third rope was still moving. The child, too light, was still breathing, and he remained there for more than half an hour, lingering between life and death, withering before our eyes. As the prisoner hung in the gallows, kicking and swinging in the throes of death, refusing to die, an onlooker was heard to mutter under his breath with increasing desperation. As the prisoner hung in the gallows, kicking and struggling in the throes of death, refusing to die, an onlooker was heard to mutter under his breath with increasing desperation. Behind me I heard the same man asking, For God's sake, where is God? And from within me I heard a voice answer, Where he is? This is where, hanging from this gallows. This is the final nail in the coffin for Eliezer's faith, where the image of suffering is superimposed on divinity. Eliezer sees God as the innocent being prosecuted for no fault, ultimately sharing Israel's destiny in the death camps. God is hanging from the gallows together with Israel. Thus, we see that questioning God's existence entails certain answers concerning the moral condition of the human being, the fracture instituted by each individual in relation to others. Where man as man is absent, neither God can be perceived as present. Violent action has a devastating effect not only on the victim, but also on the victimizer. Where one's humanity or spirit is harmed to the core. Only when one comes to the cross and sees both in it and beyond it can evil be put in perspective. What emerges from all of these thoughts is that God conquers not in spite of the dark mystery of evil, but through it. The Bible acknowledges evil as a reality and it's probably best expressed in the crucifixion of Jesus. It was the innocent dying for the guilty, the pure exchange for the impure. This evil cannot be understood through the eyes of the ones who crucified him, but only through the eyes of the crucified one. It is the one who has been tortured who understands what torture is, not the torturer. It is the one who died for our sin who can explain to us what evil is. We are not in a good position to assess the probability that God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evils that occur. The cross points away to a full explanation. When examining this event, one looks at the cross as both reflective and translucent. Evil becomes a mirror of fearsome reality, but by carefully looking into the cross we are able to glimpse true evil through it. The suffering of Jesus is a study in the autonomy of pain. At its core, evil is a challenge of moral proportions against a holy god. In summary, evil is real, the world is real, 
and time is real. Jesus pointed out that this world has it built into it the component of time, and upon the anvil of time beats the hammer of eternity. Until time ultimately reflects the values of the eternal, then will ultimate truths be fully embraced. What remains? God's glory and purpose. The longer Eliezer stays in the concentration camps, the more he sees and experiences cruelty and suffering. German soldiers throwing truckloads of babies and small children into the flames, brother turning against brother, son turning against father. He can no longer believe that a god who would permit such nightmares to exist could be just. The fact that so many Jews do continue to pray and recite the Talmud, and to look for comfort in their faith while in the concentration camp, amazes and confounds Eliezer. How people would still pray to a god who allows their families to be gassed and incinerated suggests to Eliezer that people are stronger and more forgiving than the god they pray to. Some talked of God, of his mysterious ways, of the sins of the Jewish people and their future deliverance, but I had ceased to pray. How I sympathized with Job. I did not deny God's existence, but I doubted his absolute justice. Night closes with a very weak, very hungry, and hardened Eliezer. Rescued by American tanks in Bergenwald, alone, with no hope or hatred left in him. Elie Wiesel, professor, political activist, writer, and Holocaust survivor, died peacefully July 2nd, 2016, at the age of 87. I want to read an excerpt from a column written by Wiesel in the New York Times sometime before he died. Master of the universe, let us make up. It is time. How long can we go on being angry? More than 50 years have passed since the nightmare was lifted. Many things, good and less good, have since happened to those who survived it. They learned to build on ruins. Family life was recreated. Children were born. Friendships struck. They learned to have faith in their surroundings, even in their fellow men and women. Gratitude has replaced the bitterness in their hearts. No one is capable of thankfulness as they are. Thankful to anyone willing to hear their tales and become their ally in the battle against apathy and forgetfulness. For them, every moment is grace. Oh, they do not forgive the killers and their accomplices, nor should they, nor should you, master of the universe. But they no longer look at every passerby with suspicion, nor do they see a dagger in every hand. Does this mean that the wounds in their souls have healed? They will never heal. As long as a spark in the flames of Auschwitz and Treblanca glows in their memory, so long will my joy be incomplete. What about my faith in you, master of the universe? I now realize I never lost it, not even over there, during the darkest hours of my life. I don't know why I kept whispering my daily prayers, and those reserved for the Sabbath and for the holidays, but I did recite them, often with my father on Rosh Hashanah Eve, with hundreds of inmates at Auschwitz. Was it because the prayers remained a link to the vanished world of my childhood? But my faith was no longer pure. How could it be? It was filled with anguish rather than fervor, with perplexity more than piety. In the kingdom of the eternal night, on the days of awe, which are the days of judgment, my traditional prayers were directed to you as well as against you, master of the universe. What hurt me more, your absence or your silence? In my testimony, I have written harsh words, burning words about your role in our tragedy. I will not repeat them today, but I felt them then. I felt them in every cell of my being. Why did you allow, if not enable the killer, day after day, night after night, to torment, kill, and annihilate tens of thousands of Jewish children? Why were they abandoned by your creation? These thoughts were in no way destined to diminish the guilt of the guilty. Their established culpability is irrelevant to my problem with you, master of the universe. In my childhood, I did not expect much from human beings, but I expected everything from you. Where were you? God of kindness, in Auschwitz? What was going on in heaven at the celestial tribunal while your children were marked for humiliation, isolation, and death only because they were Jewish? These questions have been haunting me for more than five decades. You have vocal defenders, you know. Many theological answers were given to me such as, God is God, he alone knows what he's doing, one has no right to question him or his ways, or Auschwitz was a punishment for European sins of assimilation and or Zionism, and isn't Israel the solution? Without Auschwitz, there would be no Israel. I reject all these answers. 
Auschwitz must and will forever remain a question mark only. It can be conceived neither with God nor without God. At one point, I began wondering whether I was unfair with you. After all, Auschwitz was not something that came down ready-made from heaven. It was conceived by men, implemented by men, staffed by men, and their aim was to destroy not only us, but you as well. Ought we not to think of your pain too? Watching your children suffer at the hands of your other children? Haven't you also suffered? As we Jews now enter the high holidays again, preparing ourselves to pray for a year of peace and happiness for our people and all people, let us make up, Master of the Universe. In spite of everything that happened? Yes, in spite. Let us make up. For the child in me, it is unbearable to be divorced from you for so long. After all the suffering he had experienced and despite the unresolved theological questions, he decided it was time to make up with God. Given time and knowledge of God, peace is offered. Memory is more than a simple communication from past to future. It is also an ethical way of assuming responsibility for the horrors humankind experienced during the 20th century. The power of memory, as we sell expresses it in night, has the capacity to pull victims out of the kingdom of death and place them into our present lives. Night tells us about human nature, the meaning of life, radical evil, survival, and about joy and blessing. In his other works, he writes, I have said it so many times, to forget the victims means to kill them a second time. We couldn't prevent the first killing, but we are responsible for the second one if it takes place. Knight's most important contributions consist of an ethical interrogation of faith, an important piece of history that should be read by everyone. I encourage anyone faced with pain or evil to never be afraid, and say as the Jews said as they walked towards the furnace of death, may his name be celebrated and sanctified.